Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures Daily Dose of Nature. Today's topic, antlers, their role in the rut. Presented by wildlife biologist, Aaron Bott. I'm your host, Rob Mess. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. Over to you, Aaron. Thank you, and thank you everyone for tuning in. This presentation today is very seasonal. We're gonna be talking about antlers and their role in the rut. Um, earlier this year, I gave a presentation regarding antlers that was very similar. Uh, antlers are this magnificent kind of abnormality in the natural world where we have a reoccurring external organ that grows in mammals and then is thrown off by mammals year after year. This incredible natural cycle that is very uh, costly regarding um, fitness and nutritional value and yet this incredible feature on all members of the deer family is something that is iconic not only to uh, folks like me in the western portion of North America but really wherever deer exist all over the world. Um, this time of year is when most deer species in temperate zones in the northern hemisphere are going into their breeding season known as the rut and so we're going to be talking a little bit about how antlers play a role in the breeding season which is ultimately why we have antlers as a secondary sexual characteristic. Um, without further ado, we'll jump right in. As I was generously introduced, I'm a wildlife biologist. I have lived and worked in the American West all of my life with a number of species. I'm, I specialize in large carnivores, especially wolves. I'm technically a, a wolf biologist working for government agencies and uh, non-government organizations as well. Uh, doing research uh, throughout the really, I guess, all wolf populations in the contiguous United States. Um, but I've also had the opportunity to work with grizzly bears and moose and elk and mule deer and beavers and bison and bighorn sheep, etc. So the whole zoo. And uh, yeah, I think that like many of you, I've always been fascinated in deer species and in antlers. Um, they're certainly very attractive, these kind of bizarre show pieces, these, these uh, natural crowns that uh, are worn by such magnificent and elegant creatures of the wildlands. And uh, I think that there's a bit of a uh, symbolism and kind of a mythic yearning for these incredible uh, crowns, again, that grow annually off of the tops of these am these animals and then are cast every year only to regrow again kind of this uh, life and death cycle with um, rebirth and resurrection every spring pretty fascinating so to begin with i like to define what we're going to be talking about in all of my presentations and we're going to be talking as you should know about antlers and antlers are different from horns which very commonly those two words get kind of muddled and muddied um, there's a cafe near my house called the elk horn cafe and i myself having grown up kind of in a rural state uh, often talk about going out and looking for deer and elk horns but when we're getting into the nitty-gritty of definitions technically antlers are not horns Horns are a very densely formed uh, epidermum uh, concretion of keratin that takes place in most bovid. So everything from your bison to your cattle, um, these horns generally will grow um, out of the skin and they become concrete and they become very dense. Uh, they grow over a bony protrusion of the skull typically and they grow on both sexes and they're never shed and an antler is different because an antler is literally a bone it's a solid dead bone that is hardened and cancellous it does not have a marrow interior and it grows on all of the members of the deer family except for two species so there's 
uh, more than a dozen different deer species all across the world and all of the deer except for two species and we'll get into that in just a minute uh, grow these really ornamental show pieces um, so moose are a member of the deer family uh, caribou and reindeer uh, elk red deer white-tailed deer mule deer etc all of these members of this incredible family have these really cool ornamental uh, headgear pieces and with the exception of one species, uh, all male, uh, all antlers grow only on male members of the deer family. And this is something that we're going to be talking a little bit about today because we're going to be highlighting intrasexual selection and competition between males as they're getting ready to try and breed with females as the females come into estrus. So the only deer species where antlers grow on both sexes is reindeer or caribou, um, depending on which hemisphere you live in. Um, this I think is something that's fascinating because as I've already mentioned, these antlers are essentially a secondary sexual characteristic. So aside from the testicles and the penis, um, which are primary sexual characteristics. The secondary sexual characteristic of these animals are these really ornamental um, antlers, which are used for attraction as well as for self-defense and even to some degree uh, uh, battle in intra-specific competition. Um, I already mentioned that there are two species of deer that don't have antlers. The Chinese water deer is probably the most popular of these. Um, and these water deer have retained their uh, phylogenetic trait of tusks growing out of their upper canines. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about this in just a second. But these large, very magnificent antlers growing out of animals such as the elk, again, have inspired the human imagination for thousands of years. Um, even today, as many of you are aware, uh, artisans like to do incredible things with antlers. Um, hunters like to go out and retrieve uh, the skulls off of their kills in order to display um, the remnants of the animal that they have pursued and hunted. Uh, again, these, these incredible things are very remarkable and they're pretty abnormal in the group of mammals to which they belong. And the reason for this is because they're able to regenerate every year. Um, but at what cost, and this is what often we as biologists begin to look at, is you can't grow these incredible antlers year after year without there being some kind of cost, some kind of nutritional cost, some kind of cost to your overall fitness. And why is it that these antlers grow on these incredible animals? Um, again, it's something that is unique, just found in the cervids, just found in the deer family. Uh, why don't we see them in other groups of animals and why at all do we see them in deer? I'm primarily going to be focusing on uh, for my examples today, four of the primary deer representatives of North America, and that's just because I'm from North America. Um, but we're going to be talking a bit about mule deer, which can be found in the bottom left-hand picture there, as well as white-tailed deer in the bottom right-hand picture, moose, and elk, of course. Moose are the largest members of the deer family, and therefore it makes sense that they would have the largest antlers of the deer family as well. Um, there are several subspecies of moose all across North America and also Eurasia, um, but the largest subspecies is found in Alaska, known as Alces Alces gigas, and they have the largest antlers, which both paddles put together can weigh over 80 pounds, which is phenomenal. Um, elk generally can have antlers that weigh in combination up to 40 pounds. Um, again, what what muscle it would take to to clout these around and to show them off as incredible uh, physiological structures and ornaments that you're showing off to all of your other neighbors. And again, what is the purpose of having these? 
for a long time, people have been fascinated with them. And as Euro-Americans began to expand westward, uh, there were all across North America these Elkhorn steeples, especially one most prominent, which was described um, up towards the confluence of the Yellowstone and the Missouri rivers as they came together. Um, these were put together by indigenous peoples, again, illustrating just how these antlers have uh, fascinated people of multiple cultures and multiple generations throughout all time. Um, these kind of castings where elk uh, would go and migrate from the plains and into the forests and cast their antlers every year. Um, and for some reason, which we don't understand completely because that history is lost to us, the indigenous peoples of the plains would collect the antlers and um, place them in large piles. Um, surely uh, because they were interesting and fascinating, but perhaps there was other cultural significance which we don't fully understand. Um, but again, this just illustrates how, how remarkable antlers have been in the human imagination, and they continue to be in the human imagination. As I've mentioned, uh, artisans all over the world like to make uh, decorations with antlers, uh, everything from chandeliers to the incredible arches, which are found in Jackson Hole's town square. Um, very recently, they have made quite a name for themselves in the pet industry. Again, antlers are essentially a, a bone, a dense bone, and so giving dogs and uh, these, these antlers uh, is, has become a pretty lucrative business. Um, every year in the springtime when you're allowed to go uh, shed hunting, as the sport is called, looking for antlers. People comb the hills and the forests looking for antlers cast by these wild animals. And again, there's a pretty lucrative business for collecting these antlers. Uh, the longer the antler is on the landscape, the more exposed it becomes to the elements and also to UV, which ultimately uh, breaks the bone down and it becomes kind of bleached out and uh, less dense. Uh, but if you pick up a fresh antler from that year, known as a browned antler, you can sell it on the market uh, for a pretty high price. This last year, I believe it was about $15 a pound for a browned antler. So if you have an elk antler that you find that's, you know, 20 pounds, $15 a pound, you can make a, a pretty good killing, I guess, if you're a hobby antler collector. And a lot of these antlers, again, go into uh, the use for artisans and their artwork or they're purchased for the pet industry. And of course, hunters are always interested in cultures all over the world and uh, ornamenting their homes with the trophies of their harvest. And for a long time now in Asia specifically, antlers have been interesting or um, consumed by peoples for uh, medicinal purposes. Um, a lot of these medicinal purposes are not um, verified to be effective. For example, antlers have been ground up into powder for a long time and consumed as an aphrodisiac. Um, there's no scientific evidence that this actually works or any of the other purposes for which they're consumed actually adds any health benefits. Nevertheless, there's a high demand for the consumption of antlers. Um, and most recently, in the last 10, 12 years, um, stem cell research has really gone into looking at antlers and how they regenerate year after year. And that's become uh, a more fascinating industry. And there is actually a market for the consumption of uh, antler velvet, again, for um, health properties which are not truly understood or appreciated or verified yet. To get into antlers a little bit more specifically, I think it's beneficial for us to talk about the evolutionary perspective of antlers. So the progenitors to the deer family evolved about 30 to 40 million years ago. And at this time, they didn't have antlers. They would have looked like the diminutive deer species that we have today, relatively small, um, living mostly on sedges and grasses in meadows and plains. And interestingly enough, uh, these uh, progenitor deer species had elongated canines that were like tusks. Um, this is a quality 
or a feature, excuse me, that we see, as I already described here with our Chinese water deer that has retained this evolutionary trait. They've got these elongated canines. And these canines were often used for um, show pieces as they are in most uh, herbivory spe herbivore species that we have today, such as your uh, feral pigs and your, your hogs. Um, these show pieces can be used for combat, but more often than not, they're used to show um, the kind of health and virility perhaps of the individual animal based off of its, its fitness levels. Um, however, when we go back and get into the really rudimentary evolution of, of antlers about 10 to 20 million years ago, we start to see a decrease in size of our canines to the point where they actually um, vanish with the exception of, again, two existent deer species and also elk today, red deer and elk have retained their canines and have what are known as uh, elk ivories. They're not sharp, but they're these nub teeth in their mouths that are pure ivory um, in the sense that they lack a, a dental cavity. Um, but about 10 to 20 million years ago, we start to see these other ornamental um, headgear pieces, furry horns, where we get protrusions of uh, the skull, these bony protrusions, which are extended and covered by um, furry and highly vascularized skin. And these are some of the, some illustrations of, uh, reconstructive illustrations of progenitor deer species, which obviously have long since gone extinct. But eventually, we Evolve, we had deer evolve to the point where these bones were ultimately uh, erupting from what's known as a pedicle in the top of the skull. This really interesting organ which generates bone growth, this external growth um, which comes out of generally the top of the cranium. And as it grows, it ultimately hardens and becomes uh, very distracting and very uh, very gaudy um, display for a secondary sexual characteristic for breeding seasons. Um, if you think of a peacock and their uh, ornamental tail feathers, or you think of the fantastic birds of paradise and their showy displays and mating dances with all their brightly colored plumage, um, you can associate antler growth and antlers themselves as kind of this way of attracting attention in order to get a mate. Um, we had several large species, which ultimately have gone extinct, emerge from the deer family with tremendous antler racks, which really dwarf anything that we have today. Uh, the largest of them would be the Irish elk, which had a historical range which extended from Ireland, of course and the British Isles, where they seem to have lived in abundance, all the way to Northern Japan. So really a, a Eurasian species. Um, this animal was about the size of a moose. So its body wasn't necessarily any larger than our existent moose population today, but their antlers were much larger. Um, from tip to tip, they ranged about 11 feet, which is incredible and the combined antlers would have weighed about 10 times more than the skull itself would have weighed. Uh, these antlers would have been cast every year, they would have been dropped every year and then grown back every year in this incredible uh, cycle of um, ornamental display. But as you can imagine, it's extremely perhaps um, cost costly and very inefficient to develop and grow these huge antlers just for the purpose of gaging yourself a girlfriend. And there is currently a theory known as runaway selection theory, which proposes that uh, when, when evolution kind of gets away with uh, uh, too much showiness in order to attain reproductive purposes, ultimately the advantages for reproduction get in the way of survivorship and running through the forest with antlers like this and simply um, consuming enough minerals, primarily calcium, in order to grow this much 
um, antler is ultimately going to be uh, negatively impacting your overall fitness as an animal and ultimately could lead to the demise of the species as well. Um, this again is a, a current theory which extends not only to the Irish elk but also to other existent or excuse me extinct uh, cervid species such as uh, Alces Alces or excuse me um, uh, Cervalces right here in the upper left hand corner uh, found in North America this really huge uh, not exactly progenitor to the moose today but a distant cousin of the moose again displaying just wild antlers with a relatively large body size so the Irish elk as well as Cervalces and many of these other um, large deer species with monstrous antlers ultimately went extinct during the end of the Pleistocene. So the Irish elk probably went extinct about uh, 10,000 years ago, 11,000 years ago, although there's some speculation that a small population around the Black Sea would have persisted as uh, long as about 3,000 years ago before finally going extinct. extinct. Um, however, this is still inconclusive and we're not exactly sure if there's any overlap um, between humans and um, and the Irish elk in that particular region. But as antlers over time became more compact and uh, more modest, if you will, um, our, the species currently existing in the world continue to utilize these again as a secondary sexual characteristic trait, uh, primarily for reproduction. Uh, the antlers themselves go through this annual cycle where they start to grow in the spring when the nutrient cycle in the plants is first starting to green up and the nitrogen content of your green plants is at its highest. Um, the males generally separate themselves from most of the females in order to get a head start on consuming as many plants as possible in order to meet the caloric and nutritional needs for their antlers and uh, during this process of antlerogenesis these specialized osteoblasts which are cells that form at the pedicle uh, of the top of the, the skull begin to develop and to grow and these osteoblasts are the fastest forming cells in the animal kingdom they grow and develop even faster than cancer cells and at the height of the growing period, antlers can grow up to an inch a day. So you could watch antlers grow, which is absolutely remarkable. Um, the cost of growing these antlers, again, is extremely expensive. Antlers, because their bones are basically uh, two, per or two parts calcium and one part phosphorus, um, but that calcium is really difficult to get out of uh, uh, vegetation diet. So you often have to augment your diet with some kinds of minerals. Uh, moose in particular generally are browsers and they like to forage on willows and aspen, for example. Um, but in the summertime, they'll go out and they'll start swimming around in ponds and they'll consume pond weeds because the mineral content in those weeds is much higher, which allows them to not only uh, promote healthier gestation for cow moose that are pregnant, but also to help with the process of growing antlers for those bulls that are out there to grow the biggest and the best as quickly as possible. While they're growing, the antlers are covered in a skin, which we call velvet. Uh, it's sensitive, it's uh, vascularized and innervated, so it's very, it's very uh, touchy and soft. Um, the antler itself is not hardened. It's not a hardened and dense bone yet. Um, there's some kind of genetic uh, memory retention for these antlers at this time period. They can be damaged and the next year, uh, the damaged antler can actually grow back and be slightly mutated um, based off of the previous year's incident or injury. Um, but again, these antlers are, are rich in blood, and if these antlers are damaged at this time period, there can be a significant amount of blood loss from these antlers. But moving through the season, eventually uh, we get to the stage where the antler themselves are 
hardened and they begin to ossify. At this time period, there is a, a decrease in blood flow and the nerve endings ultimately die around the base of the antler and the velvet is all worn off. Typically, while these males go out and they rub their antlers aggressively on trees in order to polish their antlers and to harden their antlers, um, staining their antlers as well, um, different hues of brown depending on the vegetation that they're rubbing their antlers on. Uh, the, the velvet skin is uh, rich in nutrients and is often consumed again by the animals that produce them, kind of self-cannibalism. Um, otherwise it just falls off in sheets and is consumed by other animals. Um, Again, this is a really remarkable process because the antlers themselves, depending on the species, probably started to grow back in March or April. And then we're talking really in September that these antlers have now completed their growth cycle and are now hardening. And that is just in time for the rut. So as I mentioned earlier, the rut is just a term we use for the breeding period. Now, I failed to mention earlier, but antler growth is all um, facilitated by the hormonal cycle, particularly testosterone is what drives the growth of antlers. And as antlers reach their peak, so also does the peak uh, levels of testosterone um, reach their climax in the, the breeding males at this time period. So the antlers are now hardened, they've been ossified, the velvet is off, it's kind of like the gloves are off and it's time for these animals to go out and look for mates. And one of the benefits to having antlers is that it kind of backs up this hypothesis of truth in advertising, which basically states that if you are fit, um, you need some kind of indicator to show a potential mate of your fitness. You're trying to, to gain the attention of a potential mate or a breeding female. And she wants to know which male is going to be able to sire the most uh, healthy offspring. And antler growth, because it's so expensive in terms of consumption of nutrients, um, in fact, the calcium rates for growing antlers can be so dramatic that it can actually lead to uh, diverting calcium from the bones to the growth of antlers leading to mild osteoporosis in many of these animals just at the time of the rut. Um, these antlers large and symmetrical are ultimately going to be uh, truthful advertising or marketing to females saying hey my antlers are large they're impressive um, therefore you can see that I am not lying I am very fit and I am ready to mate. So depending on your species here in North America, most breeding starts generally at the end of September, um, goes through October and into November, again, depending on your species. Um, the rut is characterized by males and female groups starting to come together. So moose, for example, are primarily solitary animals, but at this time you might have bachelor herds of, of bull moose getting together and pursuing females. Uh, out of competition. Um, you have large matriarchal herds of elk that are now uh, gathered and grouped together by large bull elk um, in this kind of pattern of reproductive skew where the males are uh, dominating and trying to protect certain groups of harems for themselves. They're selfishly hogging them and they don't want any other males to come around. Um, it's a time of tension and love is in the air. It's at this time that the overall fitness of male deer uh, really begins to nosedive. Um, female deer species, your moose and your elk, et cetera, their hardest time of year is uh, while they're lactating. Um, that's the most expensive uh, uh, physiological cost to their body as well. They're uh, giving suck to their their offspring. But for males, it's during this period of the rut where they are so paranoid about competition with other males that they very often uh, waste away and they forget to even eat. They're so stressed about defending the breeding opportunities of their females. Um, 
So while they're waiting for females to go into heat, uh, the males kind of shadow them and they look for cues such as uh, um, the estrus period ultimately will begin uh, um, a catalyst for a pheromone excretion uh, with the females and the males use what's known as a Flemings response where they can smell whether or not females are in heat and receptive to breeding. But prior to this, there is uh, intersexual selection where again, um, females are ultimately the ones that are making their decisions of who will and who will not breed with them. And so in order for this intersexual selection process to actually gain fruition, there has to be combatants of the same sex. And we call that intrasexual selection, where males compete with other males, again, to show off their fitness levels. Um, in the beginning of the breeding season, before there's any actual competition, usually these animals test themselves mildly against one another in what are known as sparring matches. So they're kind of showing off their antlers to one another, they're measuring antlers, they're not actually becoming extremely aggressive, they're kind of um, weeding out who is actually going to be a potential threat during the breeding season. Um, this is a picture of what looks like two raghorns, probably a two-year-old and a three-year-old, um, or excuse me, a three-year-old and maybe a four-year-old uh, elk as they're competing. Um, antlers reach their premium in growth. I didn't talk about this earlier, but they reach their premium in growth during the prime age of the males, which generally kind of across all species is usually about five to maybe eight years of age. That's when their antlers uh, are at their largest. Depending on the species, uh, you're going to have a certain number of tines or points off of the antler. Elk are known as a six-point deer species. Uh, mule deer are generally known as a four or perhaps a five deer point or antler point species. Um, but again, in preparation for combat, they're kind of uh, measuring themselves out against one another before the, the uh, real battles begin. So there is reproductive skew, meaning um, all of the females potentially have the opportunity to get pregnant and to reproduce the following year. Um, they're going to most likely be giving, given birth to uh, offspring that upcoming, that upcoming summer. Uh, usually for elk, that's in June, and deer and moose are around the same time period. But not all the males are going to have the opportunity to breed. Again, if you're a younger male, if you're a raghorn and you've got a mature prime age bull in your neighborhood, he's most likely going to drive you away. And the opportunity for you to successfully breed and pass on your genomes is really competitive. And uh, the opportunities are so slim that you're willing to stake everything on the line in order to have an opportunity to breed. This is kind of the, the peak of your life cycle if you will. And males, again, are willing to forego eating and really self-maintenance uh, of their own care of their, their physical fitness, and they kind of dwindle away. And uh, after the breeding season, when testosterone levels decrease, um, the males kind of uh, go off on their own. The females uh, are now impregnated and they no longer need the males, and the males kind of wander off into the woods just in time for winter. And it's at this time period that uh, you would ideally want to be your most fit. Um, but there's a lot of winter killed male deer um, because of, again, the exhaustion that takes place during the, the rut itself. And for this very reason, um, with wolves in particular, we see a lot of consumption of bulls in the winter, more so than cows. And this is again kind of leading to this high, this handicap hypothesis, uh, where again, you've got to be able to not only be fit enough to grow antlers, but fit enough to survive year after year after the rut, after growing the antlers in order to really show your value to the, to the potential breeders that you're trying to mate with. And after all of this craziness, um, your antlers fall off. And the whole crazy cycle starts all over again. 
which I think is it's really bizarre and really fun um, to try and guess what was the what was the process of evolution that led to such a, a costly, again, ornamental showpiece um, develop in such a, a beautiful and remarkable animal group. Um, when animals are are when males are competing with one another, very rarely are these competitions um, leading to the demise or the death of one of the competitors. Most of the time, they're just show pieces. Again, it's kind of, hey, look at my antlers. They're large. They're symmetrical. You don't want to mess with me. I'm fit and I'm healthy. Occasion, occasionally, the sparring does lead to actual fighting. But uh, as in most cases with competition and wildlife, uh, very, very infrequently does that kind of uh, combat lead to the mortality of one of the com combatants. Um, you got to be prudent if you're going to live in the wild because there's no hospitals readily available to you. And so if you're going to fight, you want to know when to call it quits before you push yourselves too far. Um, however, there are occasions when large males go at it so hard that one or both of the combatants do end up killing each other. Um, but again, after the breeding cycle is over, after the rut has ended, um, there's a process of osteoclasts which demineralize at the base of the antler, and ultimately uh, these antlers are thrown down onto the ground. They're no longer needed as testosterone levels drop and kind of reach their nadir. Um, it depends on the species as to when this happens. Moose cast their antlers first, usually around Christmas time, and then deer species start to shed their antlers in January and February. And elk actually retain their antlers usually through the end of March. Um, something that's been studied very recently in Yellowstone, which has been interesting, is to look at uh, indicator models, again, of fitness and also the retention of antlers. Um, one of the perhaps driving reasons for elk, which are the primary prey species for wolves to retain their antlers longer than other cervids is because they do act as an indicator of fitness and even a potential weapon which can be used against predators like wolves. And studies have recently shown that elk that tend to shed their antlers earlier in the season are more susceptible to wolf predation than those that retain their antlers a bit longer. Um, again, this is something that is remarkable because antlers themselves are visual cues of fitness um, in order for sexual selection to actually take place. And were they actually used as efficient weapons, you would expect both sexes to grow antlers and for the antlers to be retained year round. But in the face of that, they're, they're not. They're, um, their secondary purpose is to act as some form of protection. And even perhaps they can get uh, in the way if uh, selection, runaway selection theory begins to take off as was the case with perhaps the Irish elk. And then after your antlers have finally dropped, like I mentioned, the whole crazy cycle begins all over again. So every year you have these remarkable creatures growing these antlers, these bones literally out of the tops of their heads, these external bones um, demanding a lot of resources, a lot of nutrition in order for you to grow this, this remarkable um, showpiece just for the opportunity to breed, just for the opportunity to mate. Um, as I mentioned, when males are first born, they generally just grow nubs uh, their first year. Their second year, they might develop what's known as a spike, so kind of these spindly uh, antlers. The third year, they might grow what's known as a, a raghorn, still not fully mature, developed, but eventually they reach uh, their, their peak of perfection once they get into four, five, six, seven years old. Um, it's at that time with when their testosterone levels are highest that they're the most successful at breeding. Again, because, because testosterone is the driving force behind antler growth, uh, things like castration, which can happen uh, when very unpleasant accidents take place in the wild, um, that can really throw off antler growth cycles. Um, in fact, 
when castration is documented, the growing pair of antlers that are popping out of the top of the head are generally cast almost immediately. Uh, and then a permanent pair of antlers grow, which are then never cast. And the, the hormonal cycle is so disrupted that they actually become very disfigured and, and uh, disformed, um, leading to the popular uh, colloquialism of devil antlers, these very bizarre looking antlers that pop out of the tops of these, these animals' heads. Um, and likewise, as intact males complete their life cycle, as they get older, their production of testosterone is uh, decreased so that antler growth actually begins to dwindle and they become less impressive over the years. They begin to diminish in size and even perhaps their casting uh, schedule becomes a little bit uh, sporadic and less, less predictive. But most males don't typically live to that, that age of uh, ripe maturity. Um, generally, they exhaust themselves to the point that they live out their lives just long enough to reach prime age for breeding females. And then uh, again, they exhaust themselves to the point where there's, there's no turnaround. So the age or the survival rates for males is much less than that of females. Generally, females can live about twice the lifespan of most deer species. It's kind of a generalization right there, but again, it just goes to show the cost of, of what the rut and the breeding season and the uh, antler growth cycle actually costs for these individual animals. Really remarkable creatures, and at this time of year in September, the elk are out bugling. Um, out in the mountains. I don't know where you are tuning in today, but uh, what a remarkable sound to hear these, these incredible animals going out and getting ready for the rut. Um, the white-tailed deer, the mule deer, are, will be going into it pretty soon. The moose are out and about starting to congregate. and They're more noticeable on the landscape. Uh, just a really cool time of year, and I'm glad that you were able to tune in today and listen to this presentation. So thanks very much. All right, thank you so much. Now, before we start in with the question and answer session, I would like to remind everyone that you can submit your questions via the question field in your control panel. All right, let's get to some of these questions. So, moose are such large animals. Can they actually swim or do they just walk along the bottom of lakes? Yeah, they actually swim. So, they are semi aquatic in their uh, spatial movements and so they have uh, nose flaps that actually close and allow them to hold their breath for an extended period of time and they can swim very deep in order to get those pond weeds sometimes at the at the bottom of those ponds so yeah they're capable swimmers they don't just uh, wade through the water can they travel any distance that way yeah they can um, the up in Alaska along some of the archipelagos uh, moose have been known to swim um, from island to island, and it's even been documented that orcas or killer whales have preyed upon moose swimming from island to island. Thank you for that. So how old is the elk when he first grows antlers for the first time? So for an elk, uh, they're born in June, typically, and that first year they might grow what are known as buttons or nubs, so nothing really worth mentioning, just uh, barely noticeable antlers. The second year, they'll grow what are known as spikes, so long pines, just kind of like two spears sticking out of the top of your head without uh, any branching. The third year, they'll grow uh, raghorns, so maybe three or four kind of spindly uh, tines off of each antler. And then really the fourth year is when you start to see um, bulls beginning to grow six-point antlers. Great, great, thank you for that. So how come you know, their heads don't actually grow more with the osteocytes there for growth? So that platform that the, the antlers grow off of, the pedicle, um, it's a rather remarkable organ and stem cell research is investigating this right now, but somehow there's a triggering with the, the osteoblasts that are developing out of the bone, which don't actually uh, change the, the ossification process around the cranium. 
Um, trying to think if I can explain that more simply. So that it's a it's a it's an organ that's separate from the rest of the skull, basically. So there's there's no fusion that permanently takes place around the cranium. Great. Thank you for addressing that. So when antlers are shed, does it leave an open wound? It's kind of like your tooth falling out is sort of the way I describe it. So you saw in that one picture, yes, there is some bleeding. Usually the antlers will fall off in the same day or in the same 24 hour period. Um, as you can imagine, if one antler goes that weighs 20 pounds and you've got another antler still stuck on your head, that's kind of wiggly and wobbly, um, they sort of get hard on themselves and they'll smack it around and try and cast it off as soon as possible in order to reestablish some kind of central balance to their head. Um, so if you go out in the springtime, it's very often that you can find matching sets of antlers in the same vicinity. Um, but yes, there is bleeding that takes place. So when it's growing, when they are growing, is that a painful or tender process for the animal? Uh, it's a sensitive organ when it's growing. So the growing process probably doesn't cause any discomfort or pain, but um, if you were in theory to take a, a stick or something and whack an antler that is covered in velvet, that deer would definitely feel it and it would hurt and probably damage the antler significantly during its growing process. Um, it probably lead to some kind of um, malformation on that antler, which might even persist into the next two or three uh, antler seasons. Um, so sometimes when you see antlers that look a little bit bizarre, they're not symmetrical. Um, there's a mutation perhaps on one antler uh, that would perhaps indicate that the antler had been damaged during the growing process. So does the incredible weight of these antlers slow the animal down and make it more vulnerable to predators perhaps? Um, it doesn't seem to slow them down, but definitely like in terms of running, um, but these animals aren't necessarily endurance runners to begin with. So they're kind of a, uh, a flighty species, um, but they're not, they're not endurance athletes to begin with, but they certainly can get in the way. Um, it's unfortunate, but we see a lot of uh, males with antlers getting tangled up in fences. That kind of is a common story across anywhere, really, where humans and, and wildlife coexist. You get uh, these animals getting tangled up in barbed wire fences and stuff like that. So they, they definitely can inhibit uh, spatial movement and can even lead to the demise of individual animals if they, if they get themselves in an unfortunate fix. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit more about the velvet, uh, just to help us maybe where it comes from, how long it lasts? Yeah, so the velvet is skin. It's just a, an extended skin that grows over that tender bone as it's uh, growing out of the top of the skull. Um, it's covered in hair because they're mammals and so there's hair everywhere, um, but it's, got a lot of blood vessels in it and it's uh, got a lot of uh, nerve endings in it so it's delicate it's soft if you if uh, you were to squeeze an antler with your hand it would feel a little bit spongy ish um, but ultimately as the antler reaches its peak in growth uh, the testosterone levels reach such that the antler itself begins to ossify so it hardens and during that hardening process there's a constriction around the the skin which ultimately severs the kind of like a tourniquet it sort of severs off the the blood vessels as well as the the um, nerves that are running through that antler and so at that point the skin becomes dead and is no longer viable it's not living and so that skin is then rubbed off onto trees or bushes as the the individual wants to polish and harden his antlers even more. Great, thank you for clarifying that for us. 
So are people killing deer specifically for antlers? And if so, is this affecting their population? Um, that's kind of a big question. So I'm going to assume firstly that uh, killing them for antlers for medicinal or consumption purposes is maybe the, the underlying question. Um, there are antler farms all over the world where deer are raised specifically for their antlers to be consumed by people. Um, this does not uh, negatively affect the longevity of the animal in captivity uh, because antlers grow year after year. It'd be kind of like killing the goose that lays the golden egg. So fortunately, people are able to harvest antlers off of living animals in these farms, again, without actually killing the animal. Um, kind of a, a broader sense, which I think is a little bit more obvious, is antlers are attractive to hunters. And so people, are they gravitate towards animals with large antlers. Um, but that kind of is a little bit more complex because if you're, if you're not a hunter, you might not be aware that there are several seasons uh, available to hunters. So not all of them are um, premium trophy hunts where you're capable of perhaps harvesting an animal with a very large rack. So ultimately, no, it doesn't. Uh, in, the, in the modern world, at least in North America, um, it, there's no negative repercussions for the overall uh, recruitment of deer species with with antlers. Well, that's going to be the last question that we do have time for today, Aaron. So I'd like to throw it back to you for some closing comments. Thank you, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Um, I hope that you're enjoying your fall, and I hope that you have an opportunity to get out and see some incredible displays of intersexual selection with deer um, that's kind of the advantage to talking about deer is it doesn't really matter where you're at they're fairly abundant all across north america and even uh, eurasia so i hope you have the opportunity to go to go out and, and look at these magnificent animals at this time of year thanks again for tuning in thank you so much for taking the time to present for us today and i'd also like to thank everyone who tuned in today now, if you're interested in information on how you can travel with NatHab, please give us a call at the number on your screen, or you can send us an email at info at nathab.com. Our adventure specialists are happy to help you out. Join us tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I will conclude today's webinar. Goodbye, everybody. We'll see you next time.